Okay, so uh, allow me, um, everyone, to introduce Milos. He's gonna, you know, introduce himself uh, probably better than I do. Allow me just to say that uh, I'm extremely, extremely happy that Milos uh, could join us. For those of you who don't know, Milos is, uh, let's put this way, a bit of a superstar in the BP debating community, uh, uh, multiple uh, champion of things, multiple finalist of things, CA of hundreds, thousands even of tournaments. Just generally speaking, very famous, very smart, very good at debating very good at economics and in general a great person so um as i said already in the previous lectures any word i add is a word wasted that milos doesn't say so please milos uh introduce yourselves and then the floor is yours i'll also give you um co-hosting rights so if you want to share something or something you have the permission mm, okay thank you for the introduction i thought it was uh yeah, well said, well put, yeah. <laughs> no, but uh, yeah, as you, as you heard, and Milos, uh, like, <laughs> to be honest, like, I'll, I'll just cut straight to the chase because uh, we are gonna, uh, I don't, like, I have hour and a half after that. Sadly, I need to go uh, contribute to economy again uh, with my work. So, uh, but I'm happy to, to answer any questions at the beginning. So just a couple of, like, uh, things that I want to say before. I sometimes tend to speak very fast. That's a professional deformation that almost every debater has. If something is unclear, please uh, ask me to repeat. It's fine. I'm going to be having chat open, which I just remembered to do now. Uh, so just do that and don't hesitate to ask me to clarify something more, especially because some of these topics can be sometimes confusing and can be sometimes, um, yeah, tough. But let's get going into the economy, economics, economics in general. Uh, so the way that I like to structure workshops is mostly go getting the, around what debates come around economics. Like obviously economics is a huge topic. Obviously economics uh, is something that people study, uh, have doctoral dissertations about. And again, I'm not an economist. I'm the I'm a lawyer. But uh, like uh, based on like debating my debating knowledge and like the knowledge that I have from my work, I started to do very well in the economic debates and like to some extent I'm a living proof that you don't need to study economics uh, to to necessarily know what you're talking about or even win most of the debates so the first thing is like no matter how much you're afraid of the economic round, economics round uh, usually your opponents are even more afraid than you are so if you know a little bit it will get you a long way so that's what I'm, what I'm here to give you today so uh, let me let me talk to you let me talk to you about a couple of things. So firstly, I think economics debate have a bit of a bad rap, uh, especially because they tend to like people tend to remember the worst ones in terms of where they really didn't know anything. But in most cases, economics economics analysis and economics debate is like a regular part of the argumentation analysis that is coming in the debates. Uh, I, I've in, in my experience, analyzing a couple of like uh, past years of UDC, WDC, and also like some uh, other tournaments where I also love to set economics motions, there's kind of a three types of economics motions that can arise, which we're going to cover. Uh, but mostly I'm going to be focusing on the second one because that I think it's mostly uh, the one that is mostly used and is mostly widely uh, usable, in my opinion. Uh, so these three types is, is first of all, Debates dealing with the economic development and how do countries develop and what what is the thing and how what is your what your what should your thought process be in that regard? Uh, secondly, is like this financial markets, which I'm going to cover a bit less because it's a huge topic and like it is connected to the economy, but it's its own thing to some extent. So I'm going to cover some basics, but I'm not going to go in depth. I'm just going to give you some resources to read on your own. And then there is like pure economic debates, which are rare, uh, even though people think they're much more common, which is like minimum wage, which is something to do with uh, like limiting or, or expanding supply and demand. They're usually part of a much broader debate than anything else. So I think having the lodge in the first two is sufficient enough for you to beat most of the debates in general. But let's talk about it. So, so let's then talk about this like more macro view of economics and go into how do you say, uh, how does a country develop? How do countries generally have? Uh, what do you need to look for when you're talking about uh, when you're talking about the economy of a certain country? 
And I'm going to, as well, simplify a lot of things, not because I don't know about the complexity of it, but because you don't need to know complexity in order to win these types of debates. People tend to overcomplicate things and that tends to blockade uh, what they're actually doing. Uh, actually, the most simple thing is just to look at it very simply and very logically, at, like, like a problem that you need to solve. So plain and simply, plain and simply, if we if we have to gather one one simple concept that has to deal with the whole economy, especially the macroeconomy, is that resources are zero sum, and uh, some countries have more resources than others. Uh, it's a very simple concept, but a lot of things and a lot of maxims will be derived from it. Uh, will, will will be derived from it. So uh, as I said, uh, any like I'm not going to get into who and why. Do people have? Why do people have more money? Is it colonialism? Is it? Is it? Uh, how do you say? Uh, horrible things that the West did. Obviously, it is. But uh, I'm talking about the current situation, how countries can develop themselves. So the things and, and what what you need to do in order to develop your economy is necessary. You need to expand uh, the resources that you have in your own in your in your own country in the association. And that's mostly done in the most simple a simple way to explain it is get some uh, foreign capital that will go into a country. So transfer from somebody else's country into your own country. And it can be done through several things. Like one is this foreign direct investment. Second is like loans. Third is like through trade. And fourth is through development aid. Obviously, there's obviously more ways, but these are the four main ways that you need to be thinking about. So let's talk about the first one, which might be the most important one in terms of the, the, the mindset that you need to have when you're discussing the, the, the debate it's with regards to the economy. So uh, if somebody wants to invest in a certain thing, and if somebody wants to, uh, wants to how do you say, uh, wants to invest in a certain country in particular, uh, in fact, to put it simply, if you want to simplify for, for the debate's sake, they're looking at two things. One, what is the risk? What is the risk of my investment not being uh, fulfilled, not, not, me, not, me losing money or not gaining as much as I wanted? And the premium, what am I getting for this risk that I'm getting a hold on? In most of the debates, uh, whatever motion that you read is going to tackle either one of these. So either this motion can have the influence on the risk of investment and hence the impact that you can claim is that there will be less investments with, with this. Uh, or because the risk is so high, we as a country need to, I don't know, degrade our uh, labor loss, so the premium is higher. So even if the risk is higher, somebody still wants to invest in ourselves. So these two things correlate. So the higher the risk, the larger the premium I want paid for my investment. And the larger the premium, the, the how do you say, the larger the premium, uh, the higher risk I, I want to take up on myself in this association. So uh, in, in, this, in, in these things. So these are the two things that influence the, the investment to some extent. Uh, so finding a way, what, how does the motion influence this is the most important thing at the beginning and thinking about uh, when thinking about these two things. Uh, so, so let's talk about this. Let's, let's get into a bit of a, like, 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 let's delve deeper into both of these topics, for example. So when you're talking about risks, I broadly can classify them. And this, in this time, if I, if I was in, in person, I can write on the, on the table, but right now I, I don't really have the ability to like, like I can share my screen, but there is like, I can just, write in word. So just listen to me and I think it will be fine. Uh, I broadly categorize risks in three, four, three subcategories that you can look at, which also expands the economical impacts to some other debates that you might not think have economical impacts. So risks, I categorize as political risks, economical risks, and geopolitical risks. And let's talk about all three of these a bit more in depth. So political risks uh, can be stuff like uh, what is the political stability in a specific country? So how often does the government change? How many dominant parties there are? Is it a coalition government and something like this? So why would somebody care about this specific thing at all? Is because like sudden changes in government and sudden changes in policy can run the risk of somebody doing something like a higher taxation or somebody doing something like uh, more regulation, which all diminish uh, the return on your uh, investment to some extent, or it can be even worse. Uh, how do you say if there is uh, if there is a potential of ex more extreme policies like expropriation or something being on the table? This all increases my risk of wanting to invest in a certain country. So that's how you can even tie in some of the political debates when you talk about how do you say changes in government, changes in voting procedures, uh, how do you say mandatory voting? I don't know. Even the most basic political debates can have an economical perspective, especially if you look from outside in of somebody who wants to invest in a specific country. Uh, 
second political risk that we can talk about is what are the policies being proposed uh, in the current situation, which is, how do you say, uh, like is nationalization a thing? Uh, or is protectionism a thing? Like, like how does the ruling party deal with the specific topics around it? If the, if the ruling party is more populist and more uh, tied towards nationalization, this is obviously increasing the risk of my investment in, the, in this sort of situation. But it's not necessarily even if the dominant party is, is proposing this. Is there a significant opposition that is uh, that is pushing this into the into the forefront, pushing this into the discourse. This is also a risk that can uh, that in the future potentially this party might come into power, and then I might lose uh, some of my valuable assets or something like this. So so all of these things. Uh, the, the way to look at what I'm just saying is whenever you look at the especially political motions, but even the economical motions uh, themselves, you can look at what is the how does this influence the political situation? How does this influence me as like a potential investor and somebody who wants to invest from the West into, how do you say, uh, uh, investing in a specific country? And by the way, uh, this is like a one overarching, overarching thing that, that has to deal with all of the risks. Even though economists and like, like people who do on financial markets analysis like to pretend that it's super scientific and everything is like, like predicting, uh, pre pre predicting everything is like, like done through very huge rigor, oftentimes uh, like it is uh, done through some analysis, but oftentimes this is just guesses and predictions based on some beliefs that these people hold. So nobody knows what will happen in the next five years. As we see, like nobody knew that the COVID will hit and how economy will affect. Look, if you look at the forecasts for people, what they forecasted for 2020, and you look at what happened now, like people would not forget for, forecast this. This is true for the risks as well. This is why the perception of these things sometimes matters more than the reality. So even if a specific country in the reality has a different problem, if the investors perceive it uh, in a way that it's a super stable country, it's 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 uh, it's it's something that, that they would that they would uh, how do you say still want to invest in or something. So the perceptions. Uh, which oftentimes can be, to some extent, as I said, racist, can be based on some preconceived pre -conceived notions about specific countries. And is this the country that, that is reliable? Is the political party somebody who's reliable? There is no scientific way to prove this. And that's also a good way of challenging some of these things when, when other teams try to push, push an idea towards you. Uh, with something with regards to with, with regards to politics and association, but it's oftentimes very good to take a step backwards and zoom out and think about oh it's not about like what 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 reality is in I don't know Serbia or Slovenia or whatever it's how uh, people perceive it. So let's talk about so that that's broadly that's broadly about like the political risk and what are the political risks associated mostly with regards to policies being proposed and the political situation. Obviously, there can be additional stuff like corruption, but that's usually like something that is either a constant thing throughout, constant risk throughout, how do you say, uh, especially developing world, but even in the West to some extent. But so it kind of flows around the second point about, about policies. Uh, so let's talk about a second large, large group, which is like economical risks, uh, which is most having more to deal with the pure economical analysis that you have to do. So one is this economical diversity, right? Uh, so what is the economy based around? So every every country has says, has different things that contribute towards its GDP and what is this like gross gross, uh, gross domestic product uh, in the association. So is it based on natural resources, agriculture, is it service industries, is it tourism, or something like this? That's a very uh, like important thing, especially if there is one single dominant uh, thing that the country is famous for, especially if it's tied around natural resources. Why is this potentially an issue? If one industry that is main, uh, that is a main industry, uh, uh, its risks also get associated with a country where 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 uh, where you're wanting to invest. Let me get a very like simplistic uh, simpl uh, simplistic example to illustrate this properly if you're investing in one of the how do you say oil rich countries in the middle east whose gross domestic products is over 30 40 50 percent uh, in the oil or natural natural resources industry uh, the downfall of that industry also makes the downfall of pretty much all of the other industries because purchasing power of people can decrease be, uh, if, if if there's something wrong with this if there are additional regulations if there is a crisis with regards to oil uh, or if, if this if these resources get uh, how do you say no finance so so uh, the pl plain and simple, the more diverse the economy, the better to some extent you feel as an investor because you feel that no single uh, sector 
can uh, dictate how good or bad the country gets to some extent. And the sectors, even though they might sound unimportant, if you're investing in, let's say, retail chain in, uh, how do you say, uh, Qatar or, or, or something, like this, still uh, you're kind of tied towards people's purchasing power, which is also tied to a larger industry, which if dominant can, can, lead, to a, could, can lead to a potential problem. So thinking about economical diversity of a country and like, it's always pretty much good to diversify. And if you know something about it, that can also mean uh, that you can present some risk uh, towards the motion and what the motion is doing uh, towards that towards that degree. And like, is it is it increasing is it increasing the diversity or not increasing the diversity? Is it pushing out some industries or not pushing out some industries? Is it affecting a single industry where a country would that a country is affected from that can also be devastating towards certain countries or very beneficial towards others? Second one, which I can, which, which, like off the top of my head, it can be existing infrastructure inside of that, inside of that country. So, which means that labor force, roads, supply chains, all of these things. So, if you want to invest in a specific country, and it's not basically just about infrastructure in a sense that you, that usually people think about it. It's not just literally how good and how new the roads are or something. Like this. It's pretty much. Uh, how do you say, uh, how educated is your labor force? What does that mean? That means that if, if uh, how do you say, I want to open a car factory, even if right now I can find 30, 50, 40 uh, full-time employees, if, if I don't have a constant stream of new engineers, years coming to, to work in my, uh, to work, or how do you say, to some extent, educated workforce, or to some extent, like a skilled workforce that can, that can, that can do the job. Uh, that is also like part of the, the thing that increases my risk of uh, what if my, what if I cannot replace my workers? What if I cannot like do some of these things similar towards, uh, similar towards the supply chains, uh, like what other industries do I have around me to some extent? And that's where uh, some of the economical agreements can also put into play, right? If you are part of the like how do you say trade unions for example that's why lots of people like invest in European Union is very beneficial and like China everybody's rushing to invest to, to how do you say come and join the, the how do you say and have the access to the European market because if you have access to one, you pretty much have access to all because there are no borders, uh, borders in terms of like the tariffs between the countries or something like this. So how hard, how hard is it if I need something specific uh, for my factory or something like this, some specific material and I don't cannot find it or it becomes more expensive in that country? How easy it is for me to get it from the neighboring countries? Uh, what is the relations there in the neighboring countries? So the lower tariffs, uh, how do you say, uh, lower tariffs uh, relations with neighbors to some extent also increases or decreases potentially uh, these economical risks. And this all, again, influences if, I, as I said, if these things decrease, then that means you have more investment. If these things increase, uh, 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 these things increase, then you have less investment to some extent. And that's pretty much the easy way for you to prove an impact, just thinking of what I just said, and just trying to think if the motion has the influence on either of these things. And obviously, as I said, I'm not exhaustive of all of the risks. I'm just illustrating and uh, the, the things that you can think about yourself as well. Uh, the third large risk, uh, risk when, when we talk about risks uh, in, in investment, would be dealing with like geopolitical risks in this situation. So, is it like there are the disputes, uh, are the territorial, like, uh, economical, or how do you say, ethnical disputes in a country? This is all something that can escalate in the future. So, if I'm investing in a certain country, if I want to uh, put my factory there, and if I want to do something like this, like if there is a risk of escalation of either how do you say, economical warfare or even the the, the actual warfare that all influences my risk and my willingness to invest. And again, that's not, doesn't have to deal with uh, this, how do you say, uh, manifesting itself at all. It's just the perception that it might manifest in the future increases the risk and bakes the risks into the picture when I'm investing. Like usually, as you said, the best the best thing is, is, is to look at, like obviously Balkans is getting more and more investment because their people are a bit more sure that ah, no, nothing is going to happen. Well, I don't know if that's true. That, are fully safe, but as you can see, like, like most of the countries, if you if you look at the if you look at the potential of the of this crisis escalating, this is based in baked into the picture of somebody even wanting to come there, wanting to open uh, something, invest significant amount of money. 
second se second one can be like allies and enemies which means like that uh, what is your proximity and relation towards the larger superpowers this usually has to deal with the largest largest ones so us china russia eu uh, in the association the motions can oftentimes also relate towards this that's how you can connect this is how you can connect sometimes geopolitical motions closer tie with the us closer tie with china closer ties with something like this with the investments right it doesn't have to be only and purely about how do you say ah uh, geopoliticals we're going to be protected against sometimes oftentimes the most tangible impact will be if you get better ties with the us more us investors would, are going to be willing to come to your country because they feel safer because they feel that the us government is going to protect their investment blah 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 so that's how you can connect even the motions that are not necessarily immediately uh for your in your mind connectable to the economy to the economy and in particular to the economical development which oftentimes because people tend to zoom in and tunnel vision on these motions especially the politicals and geopolitical ones uh, and, uh, if you zoom out and think about the broader picture of what the country's benefits can be from a specific thing, from a specific political party, from a specific political policy, or from a geopolitical alliance or something like this. This can oftentimes give you an extension, for example, if, if opening half has taken something something away from you, and you can connect it to something that oftentimes people find very easy to buy. And economical investments and development is is, is on net. Like, like Obviously, if you can prove that it will happen are good, and I don't think anybody can pretty much really challenge that. And oftentimes, it will give you the edge in the in debating to think about it this structurally so the thought is just 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 speaking of motion and thinking about okay what does this what how does this motion increase or decrease how do you say my uh decrease my uh uh how, how does this motion increase or decrease my uh economical risk to some extent uh, if i had to pick like just to demonstrate uh, let me let me finish uh premiums and then i'll pick one of the motions from the previous uh, from from the previous UDCs or WDCs and just illustrate what I'm just saying to you. Uh, but premiums are pretty much very similar, right? Like, like to, to what, towards what I said, it's just in reverse, right? So the premiums are like the, the amount of money investor is gaining from an investment. Uh, so it's pretty much based on the amount of money that they're expecting to return from this investment and the time frame. So when are they going to get this money? Is it like 10 years, five years or tomorrow or like in, in, like in a very long future or something like this? So, so. Things that influence the premiums, uh, which is pretty much, I call it premiums because it doesn't always have to be profit, but it usually revolves around profit. It usually has to deal with the cost of production, right? And the cost of, of, of producing specific thing in a specific country, which means that in order to offset the risk of investments, countries, if I have a high, high risk of investment for any of the things that I've said, Right. And by the way, any of the things that I said for risks doesn't necessarily mean that nobody invests. It just means less or more investments or worse investments to some extent, which I'm going to get to in premiums. Right. If you have uh, if you if you have a riskier country, to some extent, if you have a riskier uh, investment, you need to offer something in return so that you attract the, the, the how do you say, uh, investor to some extent. That's what countries can offer, which is this higher premiums, which is what usually a country, a lot of countries are doing, right? What, what can, how can they usually do it, right? Like lower labor standards, right? Lower labor standards, like safety environment, lower minimum wage, uh, or how do you say, lower the protection for the workers, a lot of, all of these things. Uh, all of these things can, how do you say, lead to uh, your investment being much more profitable, right, than it would otherwise be, especially because usually these are exceptions from the regular law or something like this. So it can be the approach of country offering a specific investor like different uh, different conditions, or it can be a broad policy of lowering down the labor regulations to attract more, uh, how do you say, investors with that sense. Secondly, it can be environmental degradation. So you're paying for the offsetting of risks by me earning more money because like I'm, I'm able to pollute, I'm able to, to do stuff that I'm not able to do in the West. Uh, thirdly, like the lower taxation uh, or subsidization to some extent or giving overall different conditions uh, in, in, this, in, in this regard. Uh, the problem with these are uh, is that oftentimes these processes are a bit arbitrary and can lead to corruption. 
uh, especially in a sense that, and, and that, that's what you should, you should also keep in mind uh, when you're talking about this. Usually uh, when people do not want to invest, you know, invest because of the risk or because of the country is not, uh, because the country is not necessarily, uh, how do you say, developed enough for them to, to, to be comfortable with their money in that country. Uh, oftentimes uh, this, how do you say, lowering and this, this, how do you say, things is kind of like a, a quick fix towards a like larger issue that is not going to be solved by just doing that. Oftentimes the, 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 the counter argument is that it's sometimes the only choice, right? Because like you have so many different options as an investor where you want to put your headquarters, where you want to, how do you say, uh, do, do a specific thing. Uh, so oftentimes if you don't have a comparative advantage uh, with something else as a country, then you need to resort to some of these things. And oftentimes the motions, uh, and as I said, like I'm talking to you about more like uh, breaking down of these things, but oftentimes motions are revolving around this, uh, prioritizing either labor, labor standards versus prioritizing, uh, prioritizing labor standards versus prioritizing economical development, environment versus development. That, that's oftentimes the motions that come across and usually has to deal with just pretty much FDI and uh, attracting people to actually come to your country or not. Uh, so uh, just, just, to, just to illustrate what I'm saying, because uh, as I said, I've, I've talked a bit more about like a uh, theoretical, let, let, me pick, let me pick a motion. It doesn't matter which one it is. Uh, it doesn't matter which one it is, but let's say, let's say that, uh, how do you say, ah, it goes a bit into monetary policy to be honest, but, uh, but sure, I, I, can, I, can, I can show you how it connects to, to risks and investment in the first place. That's how I won my open quarters in Novi Sad. Uh, so the motion is, this house believes that the IMF should require direct control over a country's monetary policy as a condition of national ba uh, bailouts. Uh, so so in, that sense, uh, in that sense, the way to connect it is uh, the way to connect it towards this is how do you say without the connection? So this is this would be tied towards the political risks to some extent, right? Political risks of how do you say a country controlling their own monetary policy versus IMF controlling their own monetary policies, especially in the times of like bailouts. It can usually lead to how do you say uh, not necessarily, and and this is this is the clever framing that I told you at the beginning that I used in that debate. It's not necessarily the matter who will do it better. It's not like I, you can pretty much concede towards the other teams uh, that you don't know if the IMF will actually do a better job or the people in that country will do a better job. You can give you can give some reasons why IMF would do a better job, but generally uh, the question being asked is who would believe who people would believe is doing a better job, which uh, is in the end going to uh, like, like perception to some like. The, the, the 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 thing is perception is reality in these types of in these types of situations which pretty much means that even if IMF was corrupt horrible in the past or something like this me as an investor from the west who trusts that my western institution is going to protect my investment to some extent I'm much more comfortable if that investment is protected by monetary policy being operated by IMF rather than another thing and that's how you connect, how do you say, this motion that usually people just talked about monetary policy in general towards more of a, how do you say, economical development thing and how, how do you say, allowing IMF to control your monetary policy, not necessarily caring about what monetary policy will be, uh, on a net will just bring you more investments and get you out of the crisis faster just because people will believe you are in good hands. Uh, so that's one of the examples how you can, uh, like, by analyzing the risks, and or pre like premiums in this case don't make sense, but analyzing the risks, for example, and analyzing how the motion tackles the specific risks. In this case, it reduces the risks. Uh, it reduces one of the political risks or uh, in that sense, how the risk can lead to like more investments or something like this. And like, I know this might sound obvious to you in, in, in some regards. The, the issue is oftentimes when the debate hits, uh, you oftentimes uh, forget some of these things. So the good way to think about it, if you are not necessarily certain what to run in the motion or something this is just to take a step backwards and do not think about do not think about arguments per se at the beginning just think about how does the motion that i'm talking about influence the risk of people wanting to invest or how does it influence the premium that they're getting if they're investing in a specific country and oftentimes arguments will just flow from that 
in a sense, and that's 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 a very important topic that I that I that I needed to cover as the beginning. Uh, in the beginning, uh, as I, as I told you, these 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 topics you don't require any pretty much any in depth economical analysis to run this, and you will run away with most of the motions just by doing this. So just trust me on this. Let's talk about some problems with the foreign direct investments that you can flag. Or, 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 or that you sometimes need to answer in this situation. I identified three, obviously there is more. Uh, one is this race to the bottom, which is like when multiple countries are fighting for the same investments, this means that uh, they are deteriorating their standards in order to make, uh, so their country is actually chosen. So it's to some extent zero sum. If somebody invests in, in, in uh, how do you say, Vietnam, uh, and they are not investing anything in Indonesia. I don't have anything from, from, from like I have zero money if I'm a citizen of Indonesia, if they're investing there, maybe I can get a richer neighbor that might buy more for me. But in most cases, uh, can we say, if, for example, Coca-Cola, if somebody is is trying to invest in open a, like a center for Southeast Asia, let's say, or something like this, oftentimes countries will fight. Like even in the developed world, countries uh, like, like, like as you can see with like Amazon headquarters or something like that, Amazon second, but even headquarters, like second headquarters, like, uh, like states and cities were competing like to the huge race to the bottom, offering so many tax cuts, so many currency deterioration of labor standards just to make it come, uh, just to make it come to the to their place. Uh, the 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 how do you say the, the logic behind it? And like I know people li like to trash race to the bottom, but the logic behind it is to some extent sound, right? As I said, it's a kind of a game theory thing, right? That leads us to, to the race to the bottom. And there is no solution to us uh, to us not doing it because I'm counting that if, if uh, Coca-Cola or Amazon opens the second, court, second headquarters there, they're going to be anchored in my country and over a long period of time, we're going to get much more than I initially invested. So this race to the bottom, if you want to rephrase it for a judge so that uh, so it doesn't have a negative connotation, you can also call that to some, some extent investment, right? <laughs> because like you're investing and you're investing some things like, like I said, the, you're investing uh, uh, labor standards, you're investing some of these things so that in the future, when the standards rise, you can uh, have a better standards of living, you can have a better labor laws and you saw that in in most of the for example southeast asia which was like and also like like in, in countries that you know like in serbia and like in bosnia and, and like all of the countries like you see that the like obviously you need to start with like being like the, the very like like people people are doing horrible things in your country that's not that's not uh, deniable right like nike uh, nike operating in, in, in anywhere in southeast asia having horrible things but Usually the alternative is these people either not having jobs or having very low amount of jobs. And the fact of the matter is if they start to be, get uh, like at least uh, some some uh, dividends, some not some dividends, some currency in the form of USD coming into the country, uh, uh, euros coming into the country, it over time compounds and leads to the country overall not having to degrade themselves to that extent. Uh, so, so that's at least in theory. It obviously it's not like... It, it's not 100% proven that it will work in every case, but it did raise the living standards of, of this. So you're sacrificing your people at the short term in order to get some long-term benefit. But people who complain about that in the debate, you they better have an alternative or you call them out and then you win still. Uh, and that's why these motions, because people don't have an alternative, usually tend to be outweighed. Because even though you have, you are pretty much conceding to a judge that yes, this is horrible, and these people, these workers, are mistreated. Usually, the thing is that they will not have any other alternatives. Uh, but just on the flip side, just to answer that, even uh, on on the other side of the house, it's also that sometimes companies are overstating and over. Like obviously, it's 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 a it's a problem where where companies want you to believe that they're never going to invest otherwise. But to be honest, where are they going to invest? Like, they, like especially if if it's regards to huge populations or or how do you say with regards to some some how do you say some natural resources or labor force uh, you can do other ways to attract that investment you don't need to fully degrade yourself and obviously you can have a nuanced view it's not like we we are requiring the countries to go and be uh, same labor standards and same labor levels as the western countries but just not to the extent that motion is requiring completely degrading the environment or something this which is uh, like over a long term going to lead to more suffering or something so that's like like 
sometimes people are overstating how much companies do not want to invest in specific countries, especially given that return of invest return on investment in uh, investing in the Western world is much much lower. Given uh, it's stable, it's good. You you you're taking no risks. But once uh, when you're taking no risks, you also your premium is dropping, uh, and then uh, you you don't turn money as fast. Uh, so so that's why it's still attractive to invest in the developing world. That's why people are still investing in probably even if we raise the standards a bit, they would still probably invest. But that's up to the base to decide, but don't be afraid to claim that you just need to have some warrants for it. Let's talk about the other other things. Like also not all FDIs are equal uh, in, in terms of it. Like people also think that, uh, that in the debates, like so whichever money comes, it's good in, in this association. It's also very important, uh, very important to think about, to, to, to think about it in a way that what is the intention of the company coming? So that's why how they say it's sometimes maybe worthwhile to combat and like deteriorate some of the rights and like decrease some of the risks when it has to deal with the long-term investment, as I said, coal opening a factory or long-term fa long term headquarters for Southeast Asia in your country, that's a brilliant thing because they're going to stick around. It's very expensive for them to uproot and leave uh, uh, to some extent afterwards. But uh, but in, in that sense, uh, in, in that sense, uh, uh, if it's a hedge fund uh, turning around the company or uh, selling it for scraps or doing some of these things or or sometimes if it's the investment from uh, some other firms who have ulterior motives to just strap you for resources, it's not necessarily always good. It can sometimes be counterproductive and that's like if you if you you need don't need to look any further than some privatizations that happened in Eastern Europe after the fall of the Soviet unions and how that impacted some of the countries with corruption and with com companies coming into the countries with pretty much no intentions of sticking around rather than making a quick buck and then pulling out and, and destroying some of the industries which is what happened in most of the Eastern Europe uh, as I said uh, sec the and third third issue like the uh, first that we covered as I said race to the bottom second of all FDIs are not equal third dependency of the multinational company so this means that a multinational company that has uh, established in your, in your your country can also have a huge issues and huge uh, huge how to say uh, huge uh, influence over your uh, democracy in general right in a sense that the more significant the company is the more people it's employing the more leverage it has to some extent right and it's obviously not z like zero leverage versus a hundred leverage obviously polit uh, obviously they still have some cost of uprooting their companies and moving like like if they invested and they built a factory, obviously it's it's not it's not as easy as like ah oh, we're going to leave and threaten to leave. But obviously they have significant influence on the politics uh, uh, with with just threatening to do something. So so insofar that you are developing around a specific company or developing around the like, like this this sort of this sort of uh, how do you say thing, it's also not not great in the sense that it can also reduce. Uh, your ability to pass certain policies in the future uh, without these companies like uh, throwing a pass and like, like make, basically uh, lobbying against that happening in the first place. And just lastly, uh, just lastly, in terms of the, the risk reduction, right? Uh, it's oftentimes very hard to be like very risky to be the first big company that is opening something in a country like like first huge inter multi international multinational corporations. But once one comp corporation or several of them start going in, the risk decreases in a sense that how do you say they feel secure in their power of togetherness to some extent. If they're all companies that are Western companies, they're very very confident that then if they're all in trouble in that country, they can all pressure their governments or they can all pressure the West because they're very significant uh, for to protect them against some of the policies. So that means that uh, these uh, it, it expedites the process of, of getting investments once you get the first couple of them in that sense in a very simplistic in a very simplistic uh, explanation of it uh, so that that covers the the FDIs the way the reason why 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 I spend so much time on this is I think that fundamental understanding of like like very like very basic concepts of this which people forget because they're overcomplicating something that is not as complicated when it comes to university debating uh, it's very important to remember this, this this simple simplicity and simple simple task give me one second sorry uh, my colleague is writing me. Um, um, okay, uh, I'll, I'll see what he wants. He's a third drinker up. Hmm. 
Yeah, let's talk about the other two. The the the, the other two. Uh, uh, let's talk about the other the other issues. Uh, so so one one other way to get to get the the thing is not for people to invest in your country, but to also investing in your country to some extent, which is done through loans, right? Uh, in a sense, and loans in terms of mechanisms are pretty much mirroring what I said previously. The loans also have risks associated with them uh, and risks are pretty much symmetrical to what I said towards FDI. It's economical, it's political, it's geopolitical. It all has to deal with just a bit of a different perspective. How, like, what is the risk of you defaulting on a loan and not giving my the loan back to some extent? The second one is not necessarily premium, but it's more of a conditions, right? Uh, so if the if the thing is riskier, then you would require harsher conditions, and these conditions can be how do you say several form, right? But let's let's like on the overall level, loans can be taken by like countries themselves, and they can like uh, take it to build infrastructure, to pay government workers for government projects overall, from co for companies in that uh, in that countries for like expansions, new projects, how do you say mergers or acquisitions or something like this, and also by individuals for starting a business or their day-to-day -day activities or buying a house or something like this. Uh, we'll be focusing mostly on first two, right, in terms of the conditions, but all three of these impact your ability to get, like, again, foreign capital in your uh, in your country and spend it to some way, in some way productively. So conditions, right, like, if the risk is high uh, because of any of these things, uh, it also influences, how do you say, your, uh, somebody's willingness to give you a loan in the first place. Uh, so that influences the conditions, which is how much will you pay eventually, which is like like interest rate, uh, but also over what period of time, right? If you are a very risky customer, I'm going to demand a much shorter payment period. So if I don't trust that you're going to be able to, to fulfill your obligations, I'm going to ask you to return it much quicker than in like 10 years or 15 years or something like this that might be ideal for you. And thirdly, I might ask for something in additional, like collateral, for example, if you default, I get something off of you. And this is specifically controversial when it comes to countries borrowing money. And uh, especially when it deals to, to China, uh, when it has to deal with China, uh, giving money to the countries. If you read about, if you read about Montenegro and what problems they're having, uh, this is uh, this is what they're afraid of. Uh, but let the, we will cover that in a second when we come to a bit in, of the Chinese investments in general. Uh, but let's talk about like like generally generally the countries countries borrowing uh, countries borrowing money, uh, countries borrowing money in the first place. So there's a couple of international institutions that you need to be aware of and understand what they're doing in order for you to 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 debate properly in some of these debates. One is the IMF, right? Like this is usually thrown around and when you see it on the motion slide, people usually lose their shit, they're afraid. They don't know what's gonna happen to them and how they're gonna get through this uh, horrible motion or something, but it's actually quite simple and quite easy debates. They're very template in my opinion. It usually has to deal with, as I said, uh, where is the IMF more or less likely to uh, give you a loan and to 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 secure to, to, to secure your country and secondly where is it likely that people are going to believe that the IMF uh, will be there for you in the case of you how they say defaulting so what is the IMF IMF is the lender of last resort to avoid the bankruptcy of a country it's pretty much there to avoid like basically a liquidity crisis if you cannot pay uh, the government workers if you cannot pay off your loans IMF steps in to give you uh, the money necessary obviously uh, with conditions. First of all, it's a for-profit organization which people oftentimes forget. So it's not there to be charitable and to be great. It's for-profit. But there is an ulterior motive, which means that if a country defaults, it oftentimes takes with it also the other companies in the country, uh, the civilians in the country and everything, which also influences the Western companies. So insofar that you're protecting your own companies' investments in other people's countries, that's also an important thing to, to realize. So it's not just about them making money, even though it is to some extent. So oftentimes what they require is uh, you they give you a loan, but you have to fulfill certain conditions. And that's where the debates are coming about. Like all of the debates usually have to deal with the conditions that IMF is giving, because in the past IMF has been horrible at giving conditions. First of all, focusing on austerity, uh, economic reforms, privatization, and some of these things, right? Most controversial of them being austerity, right? In, in the social situation. And there is a trade-off. There, there, there is a trade-off there in the social situation. So uh, Austerity, as, as you might know, is, is pretty much you need to 
cut government spending, which usually falls under the backs of the people. Uh, if you saw the situation in Greece or something, so you need to cut spending in order to bring the budget deficit to a minimum, right? The issue is, uh, the issue is, for sure, IMF has been doing bad stuff in the past, but once you're evaluating the debate per se in what debate you're talking about, you also need to look at what government has been, what governments have been doing in the past. So oftentimes both actors suck. Uh, IMF is not the great, uh, like great savior who is gonna solve your country's problems, but oftentimes your government is, isn't either, right? So it's like, is the marriage of the two and is the conditions that the IMF is giving going to bring your government more in check or less in check to some extent? So some of the motions that come about this is literally, should the, should the, uh, one, one of them I already told you, should the IMF require direct control over monetary policy as a condition for national bailouts? One of them can be, uh, sh uh, should the, this was believes that countries should uh, be required to post territory as collateral to receive IMF bailouts. It's a terrible motion. This house believes that IMF should not make financial support conditional on the recipient state adopting austerity measures. So everything that I just read has to deal with some conditions of a loan, right? And remember, if you remember what I said, the conditions of a loan uh, purely influence uh, your willingness to, to, to loan in the first place, right? So that means that if, if, uh, if, uh, although if this condition exists or some of this, uh, IMF would be willing to invest uh, to, 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 how do you say, send this money to a country in the first place, but even more nuanced, if you want to have an impact in, in either of these motions, what con other conditions are IMF willing to, to give? So, for example, if you look at the motion that I just called terrible, which you still can win for government, which you won, which, which I did, which is this house believe that uh, post-territory is collateral to receive IMF bailout. You can pretty much claim from the government side that this is never going to happen. In the, you're never going to carve out the territory. You're going to refinance the debt. Like it's not going to come to that. But just the fact that the creditors in the IMF are secure enough because they believe that there's a territory backing the loan means that they're going to be willing to give you this loan under a better conditions. So insofar that you uh, that 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 you are going to pay lower in interest rates, that you are going to be required to do less of some of the harsh economical reforms or harsh austerities or something like this. So in that sense, that can be a solution towards some of the harsher problems because without this, the creditors will not be able, willing to lend you the money in the first place. So that's a very easy way for you to prove an impact of a motion. Just thinking, again, this is illustrating risks versus premiums uh, hypothesis that I'm, that I'm showing you in this debate. And that, that goes for all three of these motions. Uh, should not make financial support conditional or recipient states adopting austerity measures from the opposition, what you can claim is that without this, there is less willingness of the IMF to lend in the first place. That's one impact. And the second impact, even if it lends, it's going to be under very harsh conditions, under very other things are going to be uh, amped up. So it's not worth, and it's not, how do you say, even it, it's paying extra interest rate is not worth, uh, how do you say, uh, dodging these austerity measures, especially you can give some caveats that austerity measures can, are not as bad now because they've learned from their mistakes, blah, blah, blah. Um, or some of these things. So that, that's the institution that you need to know about a bit. Another institution that is oftentimes, uh, other two institutions that are oftentimes mentioned when you go into economics, uh, economics uh, and international economics generally is the World Bank, uh, which sounds like a very nice thing, but it's actually just, uh, just as I said, investment bank, uh, again, for profit, investing in the infrastructure of the developing countries, trying to build them up. Why are they doing this? Again, not out of the goodness of their heart, firstly, because they're doing pretty much similar thing just on a lower scale than when you like uh, world bank is to some extent uh, one belt one road west of the way right it's just a lower lower amount of money invested in it um, and much more rigorous in terms of uh, how much money do you want to invest in anything but there's very little debate that are could, could just tied to the world bank but world bank if you had to have a pendant institutions like like an institution that is connected in the east with this it's usually the one belt one road, road project which is literally just investing in countries infrastructure uh, in the first place another one is wto <coughs> wto is a joke like if somebody sets a motion now about wto you can tell them that this is a joke why uh, the only purpose and sole purpose of the imf of 
the WTO and World Trade Organization was to protect trade agreements and enforce trade agreements. And as if you see uh, just the fact that the, 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 the higher powers like Trump deciding to not fulfill any of this and just going to trade war against China, then their inability to stop it means that this institution, and as you can see, they, they're a bit silent. They're a bit ashamed because they, they did nothing and they couldn't do anything. So it showed that it's a bit of an international law uh, even though it's good that it exists, still it's not necessarily good, like a, a very, very, very stable thing. So do you have some of the things that can arise from that as motions? For example, in, in euros, uh, if some of you were uh, were present at uh, Tallinn euros, it was this house believes that WTO should allow developing countries to impose policies aimed at protecting their domestic industries, even at the expense of harming international trade. And I'm going to cover a bit protectionism in the next section. But before that, I just want to cover China, uh, because I think it makes a bit more sense when it comes to loans, uh, because that's that's what, that's all the craze at the moment. So usually, every time you talk about the Western institutions having having to do something or not, you can oftentimes uh, include China in that because geopolitics have started to play a role uh, in, in this sort of situation. So China is to some extent willing uh, to give loans to a bit more risky places, see Montenegro, if you, if you don't need to look very far uh, for their situations, and the uh, political goal of gaining influence in these countries. And it's not necessarily that they really want to lose that money. It's just that uh, like, like owning money or like, like uh, you had instances in the past, especially in the important countries, for example, Sri Lanka, Greece, uh, or some of these countries, you had uh, huge investments and huge loans getting to these countries because what they're, what they're like uh, how do you say, counting on is, for example, Sri Lanka, to some extent, when they uh, couldn't pay off in the refinancing of the debt, they gave their port, one of the largest ports, to the 99 years lease to China. So China is picking, like obviously, if, if, you, uh, if you look at it from a perspective, ah, oh, China is bad, the, that's what the West has been doing <laughs> throughout history. So it's nothing new, it's, it's just uh, like, I am having a bit of a cynical view of geopolitics. West is doing pretty much the same thing, just uh, clouds it in a, in a, in a sunshine and rainbows uh, democracy thing, but it's pretty much doing the same things. So China is, China is, China is giving, giving a lot of these loans in the One Belt, One Road initiative, expanding their influence through it. And that's how do you say something can play a role in most of these debates, especially if you can tie it with this, how do you say thing, uh, with this thing backfiring or how do you say the China, uh, how do you say, uh, China investment can be sometimes bad uh, or something like this. A couple of reasons for this. Uh, one is, as I said, oftentimes China uh, cares a bit less about profitability of the project itself. So, for example, if you look at Montenegro, Montenegro's uh, how do you say a highway uh, that is uh, connecting the sea and like Serbia and everything, it's very unprofitable. No, nobody wanted to invest in that because it's very unprofitable. Even though it's good for the country, it's not like economically profitable. You just need to. You are going to lose a lot of money, and without huge GDP growth to cover that loss, you are necessarily that project is going to fail, which is what happened here in the in the first place, right? Obviously, China is doing less of these things because they don't have infinite amount of money to do so. But still, in a lot of the countries, they're willing to invest even in, in situations where it doesn't make a lot of sense. But secondly, they also don't really care what like it is the government, like, like they care about the return of investment to some extent. They don't really care if the government is corrupt, not corrupt, dictatorship, not dictatorship. Again, can be even though even though this is what like a lot of people think that is unique to China, it can be said about the West as well in majority of the state situations, <laughs> in, in in throughout history, it's just you just have to look at what they did through, throughout the whole war and even 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 today in some of the countries in some of the instances. So it's a bit of a more if you want to be cynical in debates, that's oftentimes very good because oftentimes people are going to very simplify what China is doing or what China is not doing, and glorify the West rather than this being. A very pragmatic thing are, is this is this loan being able to be repaid and what are china going to require of you uh, if you don't and what what is the ulterior motive or end goal to some extent other things that can be bad with chinese uh, loans and chinese investments is usually that it comes with other uh, conditions. One it can be their workers working on the project so this they come up with a brilliant thing which i would like uh, uh, they're um, great thinking guys uh, which is uh, they not only loan you the money, but then, then you also are obliged to hire a Chinese company to conduct the project. So you are uh, doubly paying them. You're returning that money to them that they loaned you, but you're also paying their workers with that money. 
so so they're getting even more than you than, than you did so that led to a lot of protests for example in kenya where you had the how do you say railway being developed where almost zero percent of new jobs were opened even though it was promised that it would bring a lot of prosperity and good it was purely chinese workers working there uh, working there uh, in, in that situation so so that can be tied but second thing it can also lead to opening up the economy that's what's leading me very nicely to the second topic we want to discuss which is free trade and trade developing true trade uh in protectionism it can also lead to you being obliged to open your country towards china what is the problem and let's talk about let's talk about the free trade and the protectionism which is a very huge topic in my opinion so <sighs> I know people like to be. I know people like to be very, uh, how do you say, uh, very uh, dramatic when they when it comes to free trade versus protectionism. I think it's always good to have a more, how do you say, uh, nuanced view, which means that protectionism is sometimes good, sometimes bad. Uh, free trade is sometimes good, sometimes bad. I'm more on the side that free trade is better, more from the sense of a, like again cynical view of politics that protectionism oftentimes leads to entrenchment of power of politicians who do not have the best interest of countries at heart but in theory if the politicians are good then protectionism can be a tool that can be used sometimes well let's talk about what do we mean by protectionism and what is this so basically this is like limits that you place on foreign goods entering your countries and it can be done through tariffs so it means that when a country when a, when a certain thing comes it has additional tax of 30 percent. so when it comes to the market it's more expensive than the products that my people are making so for example if i make ketchup and the foreign ketchup like kinds or whatever costs 30 percent more my people maybe maybe are still gonna buy Heinz ketchup but they're probably gonna buy just the local version of ketchup quotas it can be that i that i want to like other way of uh, other way of increasing the price of the good it has to deal with supply and demand plain simply uh, if you don't know what supply and demand is i'm sorry that i didn't cover it at the beginning but it's very simple it's literally has to deal with the more something has a demand for uh, the, the more the price is the determined by equilibrium of supply and demand. And if there is a more demand than there is supply, then the price will rise to adjust towards that. Similar, if there is more supply than demand exists, then the prices will necessarily need to drop. So if I impose quotas that only, uh, only uh, how do you say, 2,000 iPhones can be uh, entered into Serbia each year, uh, arbitrarily i don't know uh, then these iphones will cost a fortune because uh, like there is so many people who want iphones but they will not be able to get it and people will scalp uh, for it uh, you should not look no further uh, than <laughs> if you're looking to buy playstation 5 as i did <laughs> when it came out you're still not able to buy it because there's so so little <laughs> Uh, so little supply and so many people wanting it so in serbia if you want to buy playstation 5 uh, you have to cough up around thousand thousand two hundred three hundred euros which is very much not worth it or graphics cards like everything that has to deal with chips at the moment is, is completely fucked because of the supply chain uh, disruptions in this situation uh, so in that sense uh, in that sense uh, that that's the best way to explain quotas to some extent and also like the third way which is like a more positive way let's be <laughs> it's uh, subsidies to your own local firms. So giving them money. So even if they're failing, you give them money and then their product is more competitive. So what are the benefits of, of doing any of these things? One benefit is like infant industries, right? Sometimes your industries are just not developed enough for it to survive against the super huge, uh, like uh, super huge, uh, how do you say, competitors from outside. Imagine that you would want, again, imagine that you would want to have a competitor uh, telephone that is produced in Serbia. It would suck first 10, well, like, I mean, first 50 years, it would suck. Nobody would want to buy it. And if everybody in my country can buy Samsungs and iPhones, I would never be even able to establish this. That's literally what Samsung did to begin with, right? Uh, South Korea, the, the path to development of South Korea is obviously done through some of the foreign aid that was coming from the United States, but it was also very well protecting their chaibols, which is their big in the big corporations, including Samsung, not letting under other smartphones uh, or not letting not other smartphones, not letting other, uh, how do you say, uh, technology makers into the country, making some tariffs on them, making some quotes on them, which means that this, this company can be profitable, grow, uh, year on year and then at a some time when it's when it's powerful enough then you can open up your market and it's all good and and, and and great 
the problem with this is uh, is that uh, it's politically popular to keep this going on even after it's uh, long gone, I've passed the infant industry. And this is where cynicism of myself comes from. And it's usually coming from, from, from looking at Balkans politics. Just like every time I look at the policy, and by the way, that, that's very good, good, uh, good view on any economical debate. Every time I look at the policy of the motion, I think about how would my government implement this policy? And I can, can come up with at least five or six reasons why this is going to be done horribly. And that's you, what you can project towards other countries probably and not necessarily you don't have to assume that every country is serbia or whatever <laughs> or something like this uh, or, or croatia slovenia whatever you just have to assume that uh, you just have to assume that uh, how do you say uh, it's going to be done in a similar way similar fuck up similar corruption scandals we we are kind of similar it's not it's not like we we that everything is, is that different so in that in this sense if we if it comes to protectionism if there is a policy where we protected a huge national conglomerate from the, the competition it would be like in Serbia or any other country, it would be super unpopular for politicians to remove that. They would continue to do so. And then that leads to inefficiencies. Then that leads to, how do you say, uh, uh, how do you say these companies just uh, robbing, uh, like not necessarily innovating, not necessarily doing a lot, but just counting on the profit of, of guaranteed profit the government is, is, is putting to them. Obviously, it doesn't have to be like this, but there is a huge risk that once you implement pot uh, protectionist policies, this is how it ends up. And then you end up in a horrible situation. The second thing is, uh, like, the second benefit of protectionism can be technological disadvantages, as I said. Sometimes it's just super easy because you're technologically advanced to produce, mass produce some of the things that other countries don't. Uh, and that has to deal with, this is the impact, for example, of China, uh, of Chinese uh, agreements uh, that come with One Belt, One Road. If you, if one of the agreements is to open up and uh, sign a free trade agreement with China, or a very liberal trade agreement with China, not fully free, free trade agreement with China, then that oftentimes, uh, that can oftentimes, uh, how do you say, uh, end up, uh, uh, of, that can oftentimes uh, end up in you opening up some other parts of your economy to China, which means that, uh, for example, if you had a huge textile industry, and I think that happened in uh, Uganda, or yeah, uh, if you have a huge textile industry, and then China, who has better technology, better ability to mass produce this, uh, none of your people, none of your people are able to then uh, to then compete with that, and then your own uh, stores that were previously making some profit, making some money, and doing well and well on the way to maybe develop and become a good national company, in a sense. They can't do that in a sense. That's also like, yeah, funnily enough, one of the reasons why uh, donation of clothes, uh, that, like charity towards Africa and donation of clothes ruined so many economies there. It actually backfired because it actually led to so many people having so much free clothes that people who were dealing with the business of textile, uh, making shoes or making any of this could not make any money. If it's free, then nobody wants to buy it. And then the, the demand drops and then you have to lower your prices. So that's how sometimes even good policies that you think are helping sometimes are not necessarily helping. Uh, uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, so so, so uh, let's talk about some of the problems, as I said. Uh, as I said, one of them is over-reliance, which is, which is uh, you, if you're over-relying on these policies and if you're not pushing your companies to compete either against each other or something like this, you, if, if these people feel that they have secure jobs because the government is protecting them, then they're not innovating, then they're completely, they're, they're, they're going to stagnate. And ultimately, the consumers and people in the countries are going to suffer. And the way to translate it into a more tangible impact, because when you say uh, consumers suffer, judges roll their eyes, but Consumers suffer literally means that I have to pay more for food. I have to pay more for, how do you say, textile or something like this, which prevents me from leading my best life, right? If I have to pay more for a certain product that is also lower quality, that means that I don't have the money to pay for something else, especially if it's basic necessities or something like this. So that money I can invest in my business, in education or something else, right? So competition and like like maximizing the, the, the competition effectiveness of the market can be tied towards overall consumer well-being, not just towards that industry, not just having a better uh, smartphone. It's also, how do you say, being able to afford most of the other things because you don't have to spend as much money as you would did previously for some of the things that are very basic or something. So that's how you can connect the impact as well 
towards that. Uh, and then let's let's talk about the other thing is corruption, right? And and that's as I said, the problem with free, free trade because if it becomes popular and these people start to become ingrained, especially if it's a private public company, you, we all know how this how this operates. Like it's usually a political appointments. It's usually uh, you're employing this many people, like thirty thousand people. Like I don't know, Serbia, Telecom Serbia, uh, or 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 how do you say or or. Um, or apps or like like electrical electrical things uh, uh, sorry electrical distribution and production uh, when you're employing a lot of these people uh, then you have a lot of influence and you don't want to really get uh, get uh, this power you don't want to give away this power so this means that you might do some of the things that are not necessarily in the interest of the company or not uh, but yeah that's 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 the, 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 the those are those are the two problems the, the Let's talk about the free trade uh, aspect of it. So what is the free trade? So free trade is basically the absence of what I talked about previously. Uh, and it can be, it's pretty much done by international agreement. It can be like bilateral, multilateral, or like bilateral, literally me and the other countries sign it and that's it. But it can also be like, as I said, overarching, uh, how do you say, things. So NAFTA was one of them, which had a cool name now is US MCA, whatever. YMCA uh, agreement, trade agreement. Uh, it's it, it, like it's a terrible name. Uh, it was put, supposed to be TPP. It also can be more tightly knit, like European Union or something like this. Uh, what helps here and the benefits, uh, the benefits of free trade, especially free trade agreements, is this also makes your country more uh, better for investment. And that's how we connect it to the first thing that I've talked about, more investment in general. So this means that if I know uh, that uh, if I open a factory in Serbia and Serbia has a free trade agreement with all of their neighbors or with European Union, and then I can uh, export everything from Serbia to all of the other countries, I'm going to come to Serbia. Uh, same as, as the other countries. If I know that from one from one country, I can also tackle the other markets that increases my potential and the ability to invest in a specific country, right? Uh, that's been shown throughout history, like Singapore as well, like I don't know, uh, like Southeast Asian nations mostly like being open towards the other and, and foreign uh, foreign trade uh, did lead them to to how do you say have a have a how do you say higher amount of money coming in, and again more competition because like you're having other 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 countries other other competitors coming into the market and you having to innovate to stay on the market, uh, uh, you you having to innovate and stay on the market. The other potential things that to to consider is how do you say there are some there are some things that in these multilateral and bilateral things, even if it's called free trade, are still not fully free. And that means that the higher and like the larger countries can to some extent dictate what they want. Uh, so usually it's uh, either where the arbitration and where the conflict resolutions will be happening. Uh, like the funny example, the funny example is uh, like not necessarily ties to the free trade agreement, but with the condition to uh, to Montenegro and when China loaned them money is that the uh, court responsible for any dispute is the court in arbitration court in Beijing. I mean, obviously, it's not necessarily that it's court arbitration court in Beijing is completely going to uh, rule just a, like completely. If the China fucks up to that extent, then that is going to uh, just side with China all the time because we'll lose all credibility. But obviously, we have a lot of influence if if this is the, the thing that you are, that you are, how do you say, uh, to some extent creating. And there are some things that you also need to be caring about when you talk about international trade agreements, which is this ISDS clause. Uh, ah, come on, I, I like I had it in my mind. I'm just gonna Google now. ISDS clause. Uh, I just don't want to. Investor state dispute settlement. Uh, so usually they come tied with who uh, exactly what I'm talking about. Who is going to be responsible for the trade dispute? And it's usually somebody completely outside the country. Which oftentimes the controversy is that foreign company can sue a country if the policy that they're implementing is going to have impact on their profitability or something like this is going to limit. So this, to some extent, limits the ability of a country to decide what path they want to go forward, um, either by environmental standards or how do you say, and oftentimes they have also environmental standards going there just because investors want to make sure that nobody can fuck them over. It also, again, has to deal with the risks being perceived or something like this. So the, the thing is, 
the thing how you can spin this as a positive is you can say that uh, oftentimes these disputes are not going to manifest to that degree. In most of the situations, this is just making the investors' minds at ease. So then they will invest more regardless. And that's it. Uh, then the next, the, the so that that's pretty much like like a brief overview of a brief overview of foreign uh, of foreign trade and everything. Obviously, it's a huge topic, but we have lots to cover. So I'm gonna just move on to the development aid, and then uh, then we will move on to some of the more monetary policy, uh, financial markets, uh, financial markets tool before we close. So let's talk about the development aid, and I'll just be brief here because there is not that many things. But the thing about development aid is that it's oftentimes like it, like it can be a curse as well, right? Uh, so the problems with this, like, and oftentimes the debates are centered around it being conditional or unconditional. So developing countries should make a development aid contingent on human rights records, LGBT rights, or economical reform, or something like this. So some conditions that you're putting on development aid, or you're giving it unconditionally. The problem is, first of all, over reliance. So that means that, for example, when the United States, when the United States has to scale back some of these investments, they have nowhere to turn to, and then they turn to some other actors. Usually what you can talk about is that if we cut development spending and if we, for example, put conditionality in our development aid, it is much more likely that these countries go towards some other actors which are not in our interest. So they go towards Russia or China or somebody else willing to invest. Obviously, provided that you can prove that these countries would be interested in giving this money in the first place. But to some extent, the West has been scaling down there. Their thing. Second problem is corruption, which has to deal with pretty much what it says that the development aid oftentimes cannot be fully controlled. People don't have that amount of money or even access to control where things are going. And oftentimes, again, just look at it from the Balkans perspective, oftentimes it just surprises me how much innovative people can be in terms of <laughs> hiding what money they're, they're, they're stealing or something this <laughs> so so people are very good <laughs> people have become very good at this and very hard to, it's very hard to track or it's very hard for these people to care <laughs> and do some of these things and thirdly it also destroys local industries as I said sometimes development aid when it comes it oftentimes uh, entrenches some of the things that, that the government uh, it has power over, or it, if it's sent in the forms of goods, it oftentimes fucks over the other industries that are trying to provide these goods uh, for some price. Just last thing on development before I go into fiscal and monetary, and that's it for the development aid. It's very brief because there's not many debates about it. Resource curse, and let's me talk about what it, what it is. So oftentimes, as you see, a lot of the countries that are not necessarily well-developed and poor, like let's say Congo or Venezuela, have a lot of resources. Uh, the problem with this is that resource curse or Dutch disease, if you'd like, is also making it hard for the other industries to, how do you say, develop in your country. So uh, it's a complex topic. It has to do with monetary policy as well. Uh, but let me talk about uh, stuff that are not tied to monetary policy. First of all, it oftentimes has to deal with the government control over these resources or something this, or at least selling it to a multinational company, which is in cahoots with the government to some extent. So that means that pretty much, how do you say, uh, having a lot of resources, if you don't have enough, how do you say, stability, uh, combating against corruption, it can pretty much lead to a very huge consolidation of power by the ruling party and ruling groups, because they have a lot of money, and they have a lot of money to spend to bribe, to get people to vote for them, etc. But let's talk about the more monetary aspect of this. So every currency has its value on the foreign market, right, uh, in the association, and it's, it would rely on Forex market or whatever, and it would rely towards other currencies, usually compared towards the dollar, uh, uh, which is pretty stable, uh, or compares with the, with the euro or, or some of these major currencies in this sort of situation. What, so so, so, so what, is the, what is the issue? The issue is uh, the demand for the currency. Uh, if you suddenly discover resources, and that's what happened with, with the Dutch and Gelders, if you suddenly discover a lot of resources, as they did, uh, that skyrockets the desirability of your currency. Because if I want to buy your oil, I need to buy your currency to buy your oil in that sense. So in a plain, simple explanation of supply and demand, if the demand skyrockets for my currency, uh, then that means that, how do you say, uh, 
other things in my country kind of become more expensive to buy. So for example, if, if I had to buy, if, if I could buy uh, one uh, apple, if, if I could buy two apples with $1 uh, and buy in, in Serbian dinners, for example, one Serbian, one, one Serbian, uh, how do you say, uh, one dollar gives you ten Serbian dinners, let's say, or hundred Serbian dinners. One of like hundred is more realistic, but that's where it is currently. And I can buy two apples with this. If Serbian dinner uh, drops to, if Serbian Serbian currency rises in contrast to the U U USD uh, by like let's let's say half, because it's easier for me to explain. And now you can buy one uh, one dollar gives you fifty dinners. I can buy less apples for that. And in that sense, uh, the other industries also start to suffer from this. So even if I got, even if I've gotten the, how do you say, the benefit of having a lot of resources, in relative terms, because it's a shock to the economy, if the monetary policy is not managed properly, and if, how do you say, uh, people on top don't know how to handle it, and usually they don't, because it's hitting them by surprise as well, it oftentimes can lead to more trouble than it actually was worth in the beginning. So let's talk about this more in depth about this monetary policy and about currencies in the beginning because I started that topic and now. So let's talk about, first of all, what is the difference between fiscal and monetary policy because that's what people are confusing all the time. And it's kind of confusing to be honest, but like put it, to put it simply, monetary policy has to deal with the flow of money inside of the country. So it has to deal with central banks and the currency. Uh, uh, Fiscal policy has to deal with the allocation of this money. So government allocation of the budget of resources, taxation policies, whatever, this is fiscal policy. These two things are connected, but also separated to some extent. Monetary policy is often dealt with in a completely unelectable manner. Uh, like it, it, that's, usually, that's usually dealt with in the West and in the most democracies. So that means that central banks uh, central banks are more technocratic institutions that are appointed based and are usually appointed for a very long periods of time. What do what do central banks do uh, in the beginning, which is a very important thing to know? So firstly, as I said, they control the flow of money. And they control how much money is in, in fluctuations, right? Uh, and they control inflation to some extent. So what is inflation? <laughs> inflation is... I mean, uh, basically every year, like like uh, like as the economy is expanding, you need to increase the amount of money that exists in the economy. So, uh, insofar that uh, that how do you say inflation, uh, how do you say is a good uh, if if it's if it's controlled and if it's in a level that is that is, that is correct, uh, it's kind of a control over like us being overburdened with debt and on all of these things. So it's eating away at debt, it's eating away at some of these things, but it's basically, as I said, devaluing the money. So uh, in the past, uh, you probably experienced this as well. For example, in Serbia, uh, like if you, like usually it's in Big Macs or something like this, you, you, can, you can look at it, you can look at it that way because it's very stable, but it's, but it's pretty much like it, like most of the things that you that you could per purchase 10 years ago now uh, you could not purchase with that money so for example coca cola in serbia i think it was half the price that it is now or, or something like this so every year it increases the price or something like this and it has to deal with the how do you say uh, central bank controlling this flow uh, of currency just give me one second i need to answer this phone in, in a Sorry. Sorry about this. So as I said, monetary policy is trying to control the, the amount of money that is in play and hence control, how do you say, the inflation and also it's setting the interest rate. So the way, so, so the, there, there, there is the two basic, how do you say, uh, basic things that, that it wants to do. And as I said, like the, the flow of money is controlled by to some extent controlling the interest rate or not. So the, the, the way that central banks can influence this is by setting an interest rate, as I said. An interest rate is basically the rate at which somebody is willing to give you money. What 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 how do you say what do I need to pay additionally for somebody to lend me money or to, to put put my money uh, out there and to some extent. So the way that they're doing it is setting up interest rates. So as you've seen, uh, like Fed is lowering the interest rate or doing something like this. The, the reason what they're doing is literally they're setting up a rate 
at which you can keep their money in the central bank towards the banks, and you would, how do you say, uh, get that return, uh, which is 100% risk-free and again has to deal with risk. So that means that if the Fed sets an interest rate at 2%, that means that I can keep my uh, thing and like, it, obviously it's not offered to me as an individual, but it's offered to banks and it's offered, like it's basically signaling towards the country. Uh, if I leave the money there uh, throughout their mechanisms, I would give, get, how do you say, 2%. What, what does that mean? Uh, that means that no single bank would be willing to offer loans uh, that is below 2% interest rate. So that means that it can only go higher uh, uh, to that extent. Why would they want to do so? First of all, because they want to slow down, uh, how do you say, the economy, because if it's expanding too much uh, in order to control the inflation, in order to control how much money is in play, uh, so to slow down that process, that's one of the reasons. But another reason is so that, that when the crash happens, uh, one of the best ways and best way to stimulate the economy is to just drop the interest rates to zero, even to the negative levels of it, as it is for some of the, of the how do you say, in the European Union and some of the, uh, um, how do you say, uh, and uh, no, 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 uh, yeah. And that, that pretty much means that you can, uh, that pretty much means that you can uh, spend uh, that, that you are incentivizing people to spend money to put it uh, to put it uh, in the in the in the market to 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 spend it now because they cannot they discourage saving to some extent right the problem for example is and that's where the for example one of the motions in this euros Astana euros online was with regards to this this house regrets the trend of central banks setting extremely low interest rates after 2008 financial crisis and everybody was fucking scared of this motion but it's a pretty simple motion the reason why you why you talk about this from government is the fact that we kept this so low and we haven't started to increase it meant that now when we're in the middle of covid because it's in most places, the interest rates are set by central banks set at zero or even a negative interest rates. That tool of stimulating the economy is completely out of hand of the central bank, which pretty much means that they have to do something else. And they have lost one of the tools to combat the potential economic crisis and economic crackdown in this sort of situation. So that means that because, uh, and, and, as I said, it was good while it lasted because we were expanding a lot. It was historical, unprecedented growth that you've seen in the United States or something like this. And that's why people didn't want it to end really. But, but to, to, to some extent, slowing it down uh, actually lowers the risk of huge crash afterwards and lowers the risk that you can when the crash happens inevitably because we're in the cycle of boom and bust and we're in a cycle of, how do you say, short-term debt crises and like, like people, a uh, short-term short economic crisis that happens every 10 or 20 years or something like this that we can then control. Uh, control this now, we lost the ability to control it because of this. So if you talk about this particular motion, you don't even have to claim that they should have done it in 2008. Like 2008, they should have kept the interest rates low. They should have kept it a couple of years afterwards. But let's say from 2013, 14 onwards, they should have started to gradually increase the interest rates. That would be my stance inside of that governmental debate. And I would say that this would make us better prepared to face the crisis that is inevitable at that time because it's, it's 2020 Astana Euros. There was already COVID pandemic and you can always already, already bring this into perspective or something like this. So lots of things that monetary policy can do is try and stimulate and get the gears moving and try to get the country out of the economical crisis in this situation by incentivizing, uh, by incentivizing spending and incentivizing people giving, uh, by incentivizing money, uh, being, uh, how do you say, giving uh, people spending money a lot. Okay, so uh, give me one second. Sorry, I need to answer my colleague. 
Um, so yeah, where was I? Yeah, the, the, the monetary policy. Uh, so let's talk about some other aspects of monetary policy where, where you can encounter them in debating, which is like these monetary unions. And there have been a couple of motions in the past about Eurozone and about African Union, uh, African Union, uh, like adopting monetary unions, or you said IMF controlling the, the monetary policy or something like this. Uh, the thing is pretty simple, uh, even though, again, it sounds very like it's a super complex debate. I think people overthink these debates and that's how they make them. Like I've never won this debate with anything super complex other than just talking about, uh, how do you say, very simple, logical things, which is one, that if you have a centralized a centralized monetary union, uh, the benefits are that, how do you say, uh, the richer countries, stability of the richer countries and belief in the richer countries also transcends to the smaller countries, which can also be a negative, by the way, which has led to Greece getting crisis. But the positive of monetary policy of me being tied to the German, uh, German currency, German euro, this means that other people also want to invest in my country because they believe that if my country is going to fail, uh, and if, if Euro and if anything, if my country is going to fail, Germany is going to bail me out. Similar, it would be anywhere else in the, in the African Union, in the ASEAN, or any place else where you want to introduce, where you want to introduce the monetary policy. The logic is simple. The larger countries are spreading their, how do you say, uh, lower risk, lower risk, remember, of investment and a lower risk of loaning towards the smaller countries because the creditors are more convinced that people are going to come to the rescue and are going to rescue the other countries. The problem with this is, uh, and the negative side, is that you have to create one, one fits all, one glove fits all uh, policy, which means that oftentimes, uh, how do you say, uh, because, as I said, central banks oftentimes uh, want uh, control not want control in uh, uh, control uh, interest rate and control inflation. Oftentimes, different countries need different things uh, at that specific time, and that showed in the Greece crisis, for example. That's what you at that time you had a lot of debates about Greece returning to drachma and everything else, right? Why? Because. Uh, if you, if I'm in the eurozone or something like this, and I have, how do you say, a specific economical issue, and the other countries in the eurozone don't have that issue, uh, without I cannot implement any policy. If if uh, higher inflation rate would be good for me, why? As a, remember, why would the higher inflation be good for me? If it's controlled, it can be good for me because my debt gets eaten away a bit faster. Obviously, if I can still control it, if it comes to the hyperinflation like you did in Serbia, then obviously it's, it's much worse. But if it can a bit higher, it can be a bit higher than developing countries. That can be a good thing. It's, it's not necessarily immediately a bad thing because it also eats away the debt that you have and you have to pay less uh, in general. But you cannot do that if you're in the union with some richer countries or something like this. So basically, basically, uh, monetary union is good because expertise and because stability from richer countries uh, go towards the poor. Bad because, how do you say, you cannot have a very specified uh, targeted monetary policy, which sometimes is very important, especially if you have such diverse economic economies. And that's the most criticism of the Euro Eurozone is that you have such huge differences in, how do you say, living standards in these countries that uh, that's what's leading to a lot of, uh, lot of problems. And uh, just to return to, to what I said about Greece, one of the reasons why Greece was getting a lot of loans for a very cheap and why they get into a crisis is partially because of the Eurozone as well. It's because people were trusting that Germany is going to come and bail them out, which is what indeed what in the end happened. Because if Germany doesn't bail them out, they also risk damages towards their own economy. And that's pretty much like a, a economical suicide pact uh, that, that is being done, which also didn't benefit either of the countries because Greece then overspent and get more loans than it could have paid. And also Germany in the end did need to bail them out. So nobody was pretty much happy in that solution, in this, in this sort of situation. So monetary unions can be good, can be bad. Let's see, maybe debate pops up, maybe debate doesn't in this sort of situation. But uh, let's let's talk about let's talk about the, the the one more concept on the monetary policy, which is this currency thing. And I've been talking for way too long, but let's let, let me let me do let, bear with me a couple of more a couple of um, a bit more. Uh, one is currency. As I said, currency can sometimes be because uh, 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 you sometimes benefit from your currency being. Uh, uh, lower uh, than being currency weak, as you say. So it's not, 
uh, not the logic where the, the better your currency, the better you're doing, because sometimes the, the, the lower your currency is, the more investments you're going to get because more money people are going to be able to buy here. So that's usually oftentimes felt. If you come to Serbia, your purchasing power and like, like if you exchange whatever, if you exchange euros to dinars, you can buy much more things than you would buy in any other place here, similar to China, similar to here. If your currency starts to increase, uh, the problem is that then, then investments can move and shift towards some other places, right? And that's literally what's happening with China. The, the, once China started to increase in their, uh, in their own, how do you say, econo economy, right? In this situation, the more demand for yuan started to exist. The problem and the issue with that is, is that uh, the yuan is comparison towards uh, the yuan is comparison towards other currencies started to become less competitive, and then that led to uh, then that led to how do you say um, uh, investments more going towards Vietnam, Taiwan, or some of the other countries. The the way that China has been trying to combat this, and this is where in the news people are accusing China of being the currency manipulator, is literally uh, because you can't really uh, you can't really influence your own currency on the foreign markets. Uh, if you print a lot of money, then uh, you fuck, uh, fuck up your own currency in, in a sense, right? You increase inflation, people don't want to buy it. So it's not a good solution, even though oftentimes you can print more if there is more demand, obviously. But the better solution, which doesn't include inflation, is to also decrease and increase demand for other people's currencies. And that's, for example, why China has been buying buying a lot of US dollars uh, for their reserves, because if there's less dollars in the international market, then the yuan is also jumping up in this uh, in this in this equation on the foreign market. And that's how it equalizes to some extent. That have that's what they have been accused of. They're obviously denying it, but yeah, uh, whether what else are they going to do in that sense? But that's that's the that's the story of the monetary policy. Not that scary as people talk about, not that many debates about it, but when it comes to the debates, it just yeah. Uh, let's talk about like this last topic for tonight is the, the financial markets in general. And this is that one that scares Jesus out of the people. And it's just uh, very simple, right? In this sort of situation, you have uh, companies, uh, you have, you have companies that are traded on the foreign uh, markets in this situation. Sort of you have companies, the way that companies can raise capital is twofold. One, they can raise, they can, they can, uh, how do you say, uh, get money from a bank. Uh, they can get money from a bank and just pay bank, pay the bank off. This is the most expensive form of uh, expanding. So, for example, if I want to open a new factory, I can loan money from a bank, and then that then I can open a new factory in a different country. The other way is to issue bonds. Bond pretty much means that I'm skipping the bank, so I'm issuing the bonds, which is like basically a paper that says uh, like uh, give me money, and in ten years you're gonna get this much return or something. It's oftentimes cheaper than loaning directly to a bank, and also you don't have to justify it to a bank. It's pretty much based on you're putting it on a market if people want to buy it you're going to get this money if people don't want to buy it you're not going to get this money countries are oftentimes doing it because people are very willing to buy country bonds which means that countries oftentimes like obviously they <laughs> there's a question who do the countries borrow from one of the ways is just issuing bonds which means that they're borrowing from all of us because you can pretty much go and buy any any country's bonds uh, <laughs> and any country's bonds and have it in your investment portfolio and it will return some money but it's oftentimes less money but it, it the, the more how do you say uh, the more honorable the company is the less of the risk and if it's a country it's pretty much very low risk unless it's a very uh, credit not worthy country so if you buy us bonds you can pretty much bet that you're gonna return <coughs> you're gonna get return from this even negative bond yields which means that that some countries they're literally uh, you're paying them <laughs> for them to store you to store value but i'm not going to get into this it's a weird mechanism there is a reason why people are doing it but yeah there's negative bonds as well negative yield bonds uh but uh what is the third way it's uh it's basically issuing stocks so it's basically issuing a share of a company uh, that that people can buy uh, that people can buy uh, on on uh, that is publicly traded on a public stock exchange. That the only way to do that is to be a publicly traded company, and you can be a privately traded company or public publicly traded company. Privately traded companies have different regulations. First of all, they don't have to publish public uh, and, and annual uh, annual reports. It's only they only have to give uh, the necessary information towards their investors. They can keep some of the stuff and aspects about their, the other 
operation private. Why would you want to stay private? Is because you want to have a control. You are still not growing enough. You want to have a full control over the company. You want you know where the company needs to go. So you, you want to take it into that direction before other investors just buy up the stocks or something like this. So you as an owner, uh, sometimes it's good, especially if you're small. A lot of tech startups uh, initially start off as a private company, but then you want to go public. And why would you want to go public? Because that's the easy way for you to gain, first of all, a burst of capital. And second of all, to, to continuously be able to raise capital. That's the third, that's the most risky form of how do you say uh, it, it, it? How do you say a company is taking much less risk than uh, than the others? So in the first two, a uh, company still needs to pay that money back. In the in the third one, they're not they're not selling anything back. It's just that this this person now owns a percentage of the company. And they can pay them dividends, which is good, or they cannot, uh, which is then means that it's just a store of value. And if the value of company increases, then your com your stock increases. So what where is it being done? It's usually done by foreign, uh, how do you say, ex in the, uh, on a, how do you say, uh, it needs to be listed somewhere, like New York Stock Exchange. You have like most of the major cities that you can think of uh, have have a stock exchange where different companies are listed, and you can pretty much like even from any 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 place buy buy of this. Why is this so scary, and why what are the motions that are coming for this? And it's usually first of all like you saw things about like the the investor freedom with GameStop or something like this. But it's usually usually the thing to to remember here is first of all that. Uh, how do you say these things are oftentimes risky investments and like like they, they have to deal with the speculation of the market and they don't necessarily have to deal with the real value. That's what people don't necessarily usually get, which means that people think that this is a very scientific way of proving a value, but this is pretty much our best guess of what the company is valued and it can be overpriced, underpriced or something like this. And it's pretty much a very big how do you say betting game to some extent? So it's a it's kind of a scam in some places, and it's it's been revealed by by a lot of the, the things. So 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 some of the things to 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 let me just um, how do you say? Uh, I'm just gonna give one example of even if you don't know shit about the thing uh, about the thing that is being said, how you can derive some things just from common sense, right? So there was a motion that this year's USUDC now that scared everybody and nobody knew what to do with this. I judged the top, one of the top rooms, I think. I think it was the top room. And people were super scared, didn't know what the fuck this is or something like this. And it's basically, you will probably also don't know if you're not a nerd like me in, in uh, how do you say, researching this. So this is called uh, the, the, the motions, the info slide says, uh, special purpose acquisition companies or specs uh, like our shell companies, <clears throat> non-publicly operating, non-operating publicly listed companies whose purpose is to identify and purchase a private company, allowing the acquisition target to have a publicly listed stock. Typically, SPAC raises money from investors in order to make the acquisition to an initial public offering. If the SPAC is unable to find acquisition target within a designated time frame, usually two years, the money raised is returned to the shareholders and the debate is this house would ban the creation of SPACs. Pretty much, I can bet that you're all confused but what the fuck did i read you would probably if i if i was uh, if you are in person you would ask me to read it again but let's just unpack it and i'm gonna pretend that i don't know shit about anything of this and everything is just in thinking logically about this and oftentimes the problem with with these types of motions is that if you get scared you think that every that you should know some of these things and what the fuck are you going to do but actually a lot of the answers come just from thinking about it a bit so special purpose acquisition companies. So there. So what 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 does it say? They're non-operating publicly listed companies. What the fuck does that mean? First thing in prep, I'm talking with my partner about this. Okay. So what do we know? There's publicly listed companies. So even if I don't know anything, okay, what does publicly listed probably mean? So they probably mean something about trading the company. So probably there is this private companies. There is mention here of private companies. So it says allowing acquisition. Uh, to identify and purchase a private company. Okay, so we have some private, we have some public companies. Even if we don't know what is the distinction, you can pretty much guess or, or something like this. Okay, so private company, probably you can't as freely trade as, as you could private publicly own companies. So what can also be connected to this? So that probably means that there's some rules and regulations tied to it. 
Okay, so my thought process in the beginning, if I don't know anything, is just to talk and ask these questions to my partner, rather than sit down, panic, take my head and try to figure out any arguments. Fuck the arguments, first 15 minutes, just spend it unpacking each single sentence and word and just trying to build them on blocks of it. Okay, so we realized this is a publicly listed company. So company is already publicly listed that now wants to buy a private company. Why the fuck would they want to do this? So the second sentence says, it's allowing the target to have a publicly listed stock uh, without, like, like, uh, uh, so without doing an IPO. What the fuck is an IPO? It says initial public offering. So now, if you don't know anything, and now some knowledge might help, because if you know what the initial public offering is, you might know uh, some things about it. But even if you don't know shit about initial public offering, just by reading the words, you would see realize, aha. Uh -huh, for uh, stocks are probably issued because you see that there, there is there is a there is a time where I say I'm private. Now I say I'm a public company, so I need to uh, initially issue the the shares. Okay. So now, if I as I said, now if I know more, I can delve more into the process of how it works. If I don't know, then I'm gonna spend the next two or three minutes with my partner thinking about okay, how would this process look like? What do we think would this process look like? And my thinking would be, okay, there, there, there's probably some regulator involved. There's probably something that you need to submit, right? Like if you, if you want to do anything in a public, in a public, uh, public manner, there's probably some regulations involved. Okay, so that might be the downside of it. Secondly, <coughs> okay, so, so I'm offering the stocks. Uh, so I'm offering the stocks to somebody to buy. How do I, what money do, like, do they offer them? How does that work? And something like this. And then that might lead you to thinking, okay, so the IPOs are done by the investment banks. The IPOs are being done and, and evaluated by some institutions that know how to evaluate how much is the, is the thing worth, worth. You might not come to this conclusion, but just the fact that you've gone this far is still better and you're going to be better than 90% of the people in the room, right? But if you continue further and think about, okay, investment banks, okay, let, let's, let's think that you have reached the, 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 the thinking that IPO is being done by regulator and some banks evaluating what is the price, investment banks evaluating what is the price. Okay, regulator, what is the problem with regulators? For fuck's sake, like remember Serbia, remember that this is a lot of papyrology, there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, how do you say, stupid bureaucracy or something like this, a lot of listings that is like, like not good for you. Okay, there's some uh, harms there. Secondly, there is uh, investment banks. What is the problem with investment banks? First of all, they, they're probably going to charge you money, right? That's very obvious thing that you can assume that means that it's very expensive probably for you. Secondly, uh, you might think that you're more worth than what they think you're worth, right? That might be a problem. So that's giving you, if you do all of this analysis, which uh, I hope I demonstrated, you don't really need a lot of information about, you just need to ask yourself the correct questions, then you can start to construct the narrative in the arguments. Then you can think about, okay, so these people want to avoid this and they do this by these specs. Okay, so what do they do? And then, then you try to start to unpack that. So now that you've gone in depth here, so now start to unpack it. So spec is a publicly traded company. So that's already gone through the process. And then it buys another company, so it merges. So it pretty much skips the process that I'm now talking about. Oh, great. So then it brings you some argumentation, right? If you've divided in the previous time and prep into investment banks and regulator, then the first thing that comes to mind, oh, interesting. Then uh, the one issue that I see from government on this is that they might uh, want to avoid some government regulations with regards to it. Interesting. What can that be? And then, like, I can bullshit. Like, like I don't have to have a complete answer. That will be my. If I don't know anything, that will be my first argument. This is how do you say avoiding government regulations and like I don't know some harms from that. Second thing, aha, uh -huh, we've talked about investment banks. We talked about value. What if they want to sell their company with more? money then the investment bank would uh will anticipate them wanting to sell huh there might be a problem there so so you need to uh start to think about it analytically and i know the first instinct is to go into a panic mode and just what are we what the fuck am i going to say in this debate and if you're opening government it's much tougher but if you're closing government you literally have no excuse my thinking is 15 minutes you don't have to come up with single argument just clear this up with your partner socratic method literally ask yourself ask yourself and a partner read this okay let's break this as a problem 
What if I had to explain this to somebody? What if I had to study this for my exam? What can I read from this? And what can I conclude from this thing in this search situation? Oftentimes, a lot of the answers are going to be in this sort of analysis, uh, in this search situation. And, like, and th this is exactly what, the, what specs are. People are trying to avoid, how do you say, uh, scrutiny from the regulators, scrutiny from the investment banks. They're trying to pay less money. There can be some positive things in terms of the investment banks stealing <laughs> money and like taking uh, like a lot of money from there. But it can be some bad things like, like how do you say, uh, like uh, frauding, defrauding the investors and trying to present your company is better than it actually is. Like it was the case with WeWork, which is the most prominent example of using this method of going public, right? Uh, in, in a sense, right? So. I just wanted to do this exercise just to illustrate. It might be confusing. Again, I'm ESL, so, so I might know how, my, how am I coming across in this situation, but I, hopefully I illustrated the thought process because nothing else matters, Metallica, as uh, nothing else matters as the thought process uh, that you are that you're going through in, in, in that time and breaking down the problem into the smaller problems and just making assumption making guesses you're all smart people and you don't need to know anything about this stupid thing to uh, just make some assumptions and some conclusions and then just do a sanity check and talk to your partner does this make sense like okay publicly privately company okay what does it make sense to, to 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 think about when we talk about these things and then this is like the key this is like analytics and problem solving that you can spread across any of the motion that it has to deal with finance but also this method can be spread across any any emotion that you don't know anything about, geopolitics, economy, or whatever, or something else, you just need to uh, be comfortable with something that your brain will start to make you think it's a waste of time, which is getting things as clear as possible to you and your partner, even just, just making assumptions and thinking about thinking about it as a math problem. You have a lot of X's at the beginning, and once you see the math problem, you're like, what the fuck, how the fuck am I going to do this? But the way that they teach you in school to do a math problem is to break it down, do one one, one thing and then do another thing. It's pretty much the same logic that you should apply here in, in, this, in this particular debate. So this covers most of the, pra the, the, the theoretical thing that I wanted to talk to you about. Let me talk to you about like uh, practical. I'm sorry, Milos, just to give you a heads up. Let's, can you wrap up in like 10, 10 ish minutes? Yeah, I wanted to wrap up in two minutes. <laughs> uh, perfect. Excellent. So Excellent. I, I just, like, my practical comment was literally uh, here are some channels that you can uh, investigate further uh, what, I've, what I've talked to here about. I'm also going to write it in chat, but for people looking who don't have pet chat, I'm going to also, I'm going to also uh, uh, shout it. Uh, so this is YouTube channels that I found very useful. Uh, one is economics explained. Another one, uh, an economics explained has to, uh, that deals with a lot of analysis of different uh, different economies and different economical like methods. It's, it's very good, especially for developmental economics. It's a great channel. Second channel, uh, it has to deal with geopolitics as well, but it has economical things. So, uh, visual politics and very good channel. One more, uh, the plain bagel. I think it's written like this. Uh, the plain bagel. Uh, it's every the, what I talked about specs. I learned from this guy. Uh, when I talk about any financial derivatives, the shorting of stocks, financial markets, you can learn from this guy. It's a great guy. Explains it in a very short short amount of time. Whatever you need to know about the economics. Uh, so so in that sense, in that sense, I, I love I love to watch him. Uh, obviously, you can watch watch some like like re reading material from like like CNBC business also has a very good. Uh, economics channel but it's these three are my main main go to go to channels if it comes to to the economy per se if you want to uh, have some like reading material i suggest uh, like uh, i suggest taleb <laughs> um, uh, if i if i fucked up his name i'm sorry uh, but he has four books one is called uh, uh, one is I start to uh, I suggest you start with fooled by randomness. Then there is like uh, how do you say black swan, anti fragility, and uh, how do you say uh, skin in the game. All good books that have to deal with also philosophy. It's very interesting books because they're not really economic books. They're like philosophy, economics. I don't know everything. It's a very interesting guy, and it gives you some perspective on this. Uh, give you some perspective on. Um, I would suggest you start by this. If if I have something else, let me let me think. Uh, let me think. I have had some other things as well. 
but to be honest, to be honest, I think this is it. This is enough. Three channels and, and like four books from one guy. Uh, it should be should be, should be enough to get you started in researching, uh, in research, researching for yourself, and that that has to deal with me also wanting to finish in two three minutes. So I got a bit overboard. I still have to work tonight. Uh, sorry, I've talked about very long. Talked about it very long. I didn't see any particular questions. If you have any questions, you can ask me now. Feel free. But yeah, we should. If not, then. Uh, then we're done and I hope this was useful and not boring. Or Thank you very much, Milos, for this extensive explanation yeah. of, of debate economics. But um, I think it was, as I said, very useful, very cool for all of our uh, listeners. Mm -hmm. um, thank you again. Um, so all of the lectures we've had so far are available at the Zion Proti YouTube uh, channel, which mm -hmm. you can check out for uh, links to other similar um, mm -hmm. electives. Uh, thanks again, Milos, for your time. And yeah. uh, thank you everyone for listening and we'll see you around. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.